All right, so we are going to continue our look at categorical data. And again, it's all about how do we present this data? How do we present the data so that insights can be gathered um, and we can learn a little bit more about what it's trying to tell us? Because again, data is only useful if you're able to gather some sort of insight from it. So we're going to look at the case now where we have two different categorical um, variables to analyze a situation. So everything we've looked at so far has been like a single categorical variable. Now we're going to say we've got two variables and we're kind of combining them um, to get more insight into how people feel about a certain issue. All right, so the most common technique that we're going to do is just a two-way table, which is a table that shows two categorical variables. Um, and we usually just say, you know, we call them the column variable. So one column variable, and then we call the other one the row variable, and one row variable. All right, so we have a little example here. Let's pretend the question was, what are your chances of being rich by age 30? Our column variable is gender. So we've got female and male. Our row variable is their opinion on this question. So we've got no chance, probably not, 50-50, good chance, almost certain. All right, so prior to this, we would have just been looking at a single variable. So when we talked about distribution from last notes, all right, that would have been like if this male and female wasn't there and we were just looking at totals, all right? So this would be the distribution of opinion. No chance, probably not, 50-50, good chance, almost certain. And these would be the results. Or we could flip it around the other way and say, all right, this was our distribution for, it's a little harder for me to do this one. This is our distribution for gender. All right, the two categories that we have for this survey are female and male. And then these are the values that are corresponding to those, all right? And we would ignore all that other stuff. The two-way table lets us look at both of these at once and then analyze, is there a connection between opinion and gender? All right, does one of these variables influence the other? Um, and that's, again, gives us more insight. It gives us more information from the raw data um, and hopefully allows us to make better decisions, better analyze the situation, um, and so on and so forth. All right, so when we have one of these two tables, we're going to talk about marginal and conditional distributions. So the marginal distribution is the distribution and generally when we do a marginal distribution we're going to be using percents of either variable so what i'm going to put here as a little note is you're using all the individuals. So when you calculate something, it's gonna be over the table total, all right? Anytime you're calculating your percentage here, when you're doing a marginal distribution, it's always over the table total, all right? Another way to remember this is you're using the info at the margins, which is another way of saying the edge of the table. All right, so if we're trying to calculate marginal distributions, we can ignore all of this information in the middle and focus on these numbers at the margins. So 2367, 2459, 4826, 
194, 712, 1416, 1421, 1083. We ignore this broken down data and stick with the information at the margins. So if we're looking at the marginal distribution of opinion, it's almost like we're pretending that we don't know anything about gender. We're just ignoring gender completely and saying, oh, well, 194 out of 4826, 714, that's a typo because it says 712 up here and 714 down there. It's very embarrassing for me. Um, so let's assume that the table, well, let's see which one's right. Three, four, 10, 16, the table's right. So let's pretend that this is the two that it's supposed to be. So that's 712. Um, 1416, 1421, 1083. But notice that in each of these cases, the denominator, or for you less fancy people, the bottom of the fraction is the 4826. It's always the table total. And we're basically pretending that gender was never even collected. If I asked for the marginal distribution of gender, I would be just using the gender information and pretending that opinion didn't even exist. So 2367 over 4826, 2459 over 4826, all right? Notice the marginal distributions add to 100% because again, we are using the table total. So if we look at every single option, they should add to 100%. So this is basically the distribution that we looked at last class. It's just when we have two variables, we give it the extra name of marginal distribution so that we can specify exactly what we're looking at. But this would be the marginal distribution. We're using the data at the margins. All right, now again, the reason we need this specification is because with these tables, we'll also be calculating conditional distributions. All right, so this is the distribution. And again, we'll primarily be doing this using percents um, of one value of the variables. across all values of the other variable. And then the little note that I'm going to put there is that you isolate yourself to a single row or column, right? And whether it's a row or column is gonna depend on like what conditional distribution you're trying to find and what the, the question is asking. So for example, it says, what is the conditional distribution of opinion among females? So for the gender variable, we are locking in on just females. And then for the opinion variable, we are figuring out what all the percentages are. So if we go back to our table here, we would limit ourselves to the female column and see what the distribution is just using the female column. So that means 96 over 2367, 426 over 2367, 696 over 2367, and so on and so forth. But for the one variable gender, we've limited ourselves to a single value. And then for the other variable opinion, we're going to do each of those calculations. All right. So for example, if we were doing no chance, it would be 96 out of 2, 3, six, seven, which would be about 4.1%. And then we would just go and do the same thing for all of the other ones. Some chance, 50-50, good chance, and then almost certain, which reminds me of the movie Almost Famous, which is not a bad movie. Um, 
four, two, six, over two, three, six, seven, six, nine, six, over two, three, six, seven, six, six, three, over two, three, six, seven, and then four, eight, what was it? Four, eight, six. 4, 8, 6 out of 2, 3, 6, 7. And then again, just calculating all of those as percentages. Um, a lot of times I'm going to be asked like, oh, what do you want it rounded to? I don't have a hard and fast rule on rounding in this class. I'm going to assume that as seniors or juniors in a college level class, that you know how to round numbers. Um, so I'm not going to like specify exactly what's around, just like be reasonable about it. If you want to do it to the tens, do it to the hundreds. I mean, make it appropriate to sort of the question you're answering and then just make sure that you round correctly. Like I'm not going to take off if you choose to round to the hundreds as opposed to the tenths. Um, but I will take off if you round incorrectly. So just whatever you choose, make sure you do it correctly. Um, and then this is normally where if you were in class right now, I'd ask you to just do the males on your own. Um, so take a moment, pause the video if you need to, but just do the males on your own. Again, you'd be limiting yourself to just a single column. So you're not using the table total and then you're just calculating every percentage down that column. So again, same thing we were doing here. Um, just different numbers. So I'll put them down, but hopefully you tried these on your own um, just to make sure that you're good with this. All right, so like a lot of things that we're going to do in this class, the math isn't all that challenging. You know, I'm dividing numbers here. Hopefully you can divide numbers and type things in your calculator. Um, but it's more being able to understand the vocabulary and make sure you know what the question is actually asking. So if I ask for the conditional distribution of opinion among males, you have to know that these are the fractions that you're setting up. Um, and then the percentage part is, is pretty easy. Um, it's just a matter of kind of walking through the steps and actually doing it. But you've got to have the knowledge to to know the, the fractions that you're actually setting up. All right, so decimal there, make sure that's clear. Um, just a note here, you could also do the conditional di distribution of gender among those who hold a certain opinion. So if you did, did that, there would be 2% in each of five distributions. Um, so I'll, I'm just gonna do one of them here, but if I turn the language around and ask for the conditional distribution of gender, all right, conditional distribution of gender, that means that my percentages that I'm calculating should be dealing with genders, all right? So my percent male, percent female, and then among those who sold, hold a certain opinion, I would do it once for each opinion, all right? So, so, once for each opinion. So for example, um, if the opinion was no chance, I could go over here and I could say, oh, no chance. That's this row right here. So that's 96 out of 194 for the females. And for the males, it's 98 out of 194, 194. All right, that's a four, and let me just, 194. All right, and then you could keep going and do that same thing over and over again. So again, none of it difficult math, but making sure that if you read a sentence like this, the conditional distribution of gender among those who hold a certain opinion, you recognize what direction in the table you have to go, all right? Since it says conditional distribution of gender, your percentages should be dealing with male and female. 
If it had said conditional distribution of opinion, your percentages should be dealing with no chance, some chance, 50-50, good chance, almost certain. The second part there is how you're breaking it up. All right. So again, that's probably the trickiest part is just making sure you kind of understand the language on that um, so that you um, express it appropriately. All right. So we've got the two-way table. Um, and then here are some of the graphs that fit in with the two-way table and can be used to visually represent the same information that a two-way table is representing. All right. So one, 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 uh, one option is the side-by-side -side bar graph. And generally, again, if we're trying to choose B intelligent statisticians, this is probably one of the best choices because it very easily and quickly gives you that comparison of, all right, almost none. Again, it's hard to see on this um, on this printout, but one of these is supposed to be shaded. So I'm going to shade this one here. If it had been like a color printout, it, you would have seen it a little better. Um, but this kind of lets us see like, oh, I can see exactly sort of where things um, diverge and I can see in each categories, which categories are they pretty much giving the same responses? Which categories is there a split by gender? Um, but it's a very quick comparison. Um, so conclusion, men seem somewhat more confident they will be rich by 30. For example, men were more likely to say good chance um, than females. Compare this to the segmented bar chart, all right? Again, we've got male, female. It's giving us like the breakdown of, okay, in females, what percent said almost none? What percent said some? What percent said 50-50? What percent said good chance? What percent said almost certain? But it's hard to do the same comparisons that we did over here, all right? Technically, these two graphs are comparing the same information, but it can be a much, it's much more difficult here because the categories and sections don't line up. So like once these get a little offset, like we can see like right here, you know, these are now a little offset. It can be very difficult to actually compare categories. All right. This is almost like we're just making two separate pie charts um, for the two categories. But two separate pie charts would actually probably be more useful because it's easier to compare a piece to the whole. So again, the segmented bar chart, it's one of those things that like visually might look kind of interesting. Like, oh, look, I've got the five different colors and I can see how each one sort of stacks up. But it's probably not as useful as a tool as the side by side bar graph. So again, you're a statistician, you want people to compare how male and females differ on their opinions. Technically, both of these are expressing that information, but this is a much more effective tool at expressing that, all right? So you're taking each category and you're saying what percent male, what percent female, what percent male, what percent female. This is technically conveying that same information, but it makes it a lot harder to like actually compare them because you're trying to like mentally in your mind shift the bars so they line up um and it, it it it's difficult to do that now this does give a better sense of the part to the whole so again if that's your goal and you're trying to say like all right well this part compared to everything else or this part compared to everything else all right this is a much better tool than this is over here but again, I'm not even sure that it's better than just making a separate pie chart for female and a separate pie chart for male. Um, again, it depends what you're talking about. It depends what argument you're trying to make. Um, but again, it's always trying to pick the right tool for, for whatever you're trying to accomplish. All right, association. What do we mean when we say there's an association between two variables? Um, basically, when... there is a relationship between two variables
we say there is an association. And what do I mean by relationship? I basically mean they have different conditional distributions. So going way back to what we just did. All right, so let's flip back to this sheet right here. All right, if we had calculated these and they had been exactly the same, 4, 4, 18, 18, 29, 29, 28, 28, 20, 20, we would have said there's no association, there's no relationship between opinion and gender. Right? Knowing gender doesn't tell me any information about the opinions someone is likely to keep. Right? It's basically they're unrelated. Um, when there's an association, that means that knowing one of these, whether you're male or female, tells me something about the opinions that you're likely to keep. Right? Like maybe if you're female, you're more likely to be realistic and say there's only a some chance that you're going to be rich. If you're male, you're more delusional and you think it's almost certain that you're going to be rich. So the idea of the two-way table is it lets us sort of establish whether there's an association or a relationship between these two variables. That is, is there this connection? We can't say that one causes the other, all right? We're going to get into that later when we start to talk about like experiments and and how to, how to test for these things, but we can say there's an association. Um, the, the phrase that you always hear in, in stats is correlation does not equal causation. Yes, there seems to be a connection, but we can't actually say that one is causing the other. So for example, in this case, we conclude there's an association between gender and opinion because the conditional distributions of opinions were different for males and females. Now, this idea of different, like what counts as different, we're actually going to get into that later in the course, and we'll put some hard calculations on that. But for right now, we're just going to kind of do it by sort of instinct and gut feeling. Like, you know, if they're all just like a tenth of a percent apart, they're probably not that different. But if you're seeing some like substantial diversions, um, then we can say that for for the time being, there is an association. So, like, if we look at this chart, there does seem to be this tendency here. Um, for males to be more, again, optimistic or delusional about their chance of being um, very wealthy, whereas the females are maybe a little more realistic um, down here. So there does seem to be some sort of association or relationship. All right. Last but not least, the Simpsons paradox. All right. So this is something that can pop up when you're doing um, two-way tables and when you're calculating these distributions. And it's a little quirk that can happen um, when the groups you're comparing have radically different sizes. All right, so uh, the Simpsons paradox actually has nothing to do with the Simpsons, but I wanted to put that picture there anyways, is when the association between two variables, is reversed due to the introduction of a third variable. All right, and I'm actually in the posting of today's lesson. There's going to be an article um, from the last few months that shows an example of Simpson's paradox. So this isn't just some sort of like academic, like, oh, this thing happens. Like it does influence real world data and it can, it can cause us to make mistakes when we're analyzing a situation. So I encourage you to check out that article um, just so that you see that, you know, it's not all schoolwork. It does, it does have real world implications. But let's just run through an example so that you can see how this works. So let's say I have accident data, all right? And what I have here is the mode of transportation 
and the survival outcome. All right. So this is saying that in accidents where the victim was transported by a helicopter, 64 times they died, 136 times they survived out of 200 in total. When they were transported via an ambulance on the road, 260 times they died, 840 times they survived for 1,100. So starting right off, just notice that these two groups are drastically different sizes because that's what's gonna partly fuel this paradox. So if I wanna know what percent died, I could do 64 over 200 and say, oh, 32% died. And then I could do 260 over 1100. And I could be like, oh, 23.6% died. So if you looked at this, you might say to yourself, oh, I'm more likely to die if I'm in a helicopter than if I'm in an ambulance. Okay. But then somebody might pop up and say, yeah, but maybe that's because the helicopter is used for more serious accidents. All right. So we can check that out and let's go right here. All right. So now we're breaking it down. We're introducing this third variable and we're saying, all right, how serious is the accident? So for serious accidents with the helicopter, 48 out of 100 died, which should be pretty easy. That's 48%. Down here for the less serious accidents, 16 out of 100 died, which is 16%. All right. So this is all helicopter. All right. So this right here, this right here, this right here, this right here, that's all for the helicopter. All right. In contrast, let's go down and look at the ambulance. So for the serious accidents, we had 60 out of 100 or 60%. And then for the less serious, we had 200 out of 1,000 for 20 percent all right so this is for ambulance or road now look at what happened here when we looked at just the serious accidents you were less likely to die in a helicopter than you were in an ambulance all right so tells you you want to be in a helicopter when you look at the less serious accidents you died 16 percent of the time in the helicopter and 20% of the time in an ambulance. So in both cases, the helicopter was better, all right? Better, 48 to 60, better, 16 to 20. But when we combine them together, the helicopter went from being better to being worse. So depending on how you analyze the data, you might come to two very separate conclusions. With one conclusion, you're saying it's better to be on a helicopter. On another, you're saying it's better to be on the ambulance. All right. And this is Simpson's paradox. All right. We're seeing the association totally reversed when we introduce a third variable. Here it was, the helicopter was worse because 32% died versus 23.6. We introduced that third variable and it flips the relationship. Now the helicopter is better in both of these. And again, it comes back to these unbalanced groups, all right? If we look at the helicopter, 50% of its accidents were serious and 50% of its accidents were less serious. In contrast, when we look at the road or the regular ambulance, only 9% of their accidents were serious versus 91% of their accidents were less serious. So even though this 20% is higher than 16%, it's given way more weight 
because it's 91% of the accidents. Even though the 60% is higher than the 48%, it's given way less weight because it's only 90% of the accidents. So 91% of 20 and 9% of 60 ends up being lower than 50% of 16 and 50% of 48. So again, the, the, the radically different group size leads to this non-intuitive result where you can have it be better in the broken down data, but then look worse when you actually combine it. All right. And that's what we call Simpson's paradox. Um, again, there's going to be an article that sort of talks about this in more detail. Um, check it out because it does show that it can pop up in real world data and have implications. Like if people aren't considering this, it might lead them to pass bad laws or choose bad policies or spend money in the wrong places. Um, so these things do have real world impacts and it's important that you're aware of them so that you avoid falling into those traps. All right, that's it for today. Hope this was helpful and uh, talk to you later. Bye.